Good evening. My name is Jana Lilly. Welcome to the Great Rebellion, Bennington and the Civil War. Most people think of the Battle of Bennington as our greatest contribution in American history. But soldiers from Bennington have been dedicated to this country for almost 250 years. From the Revolution in the War of 1812 to Vietnam in the Gulf Wars, Bennington has contributed its shares of patriots and heroes. The Civil War is no exception. In fact, more soldiers fought and died in the Civil War from Bennington than the more famous Williams Act battle. This is our story. I'm your host. I live in Bennington today, 2020. And like you, I know the story of the Civil War and who won. Spoiler alert, the North wins. But our two characters are mid-19th century. They don't really know what's going to happen one day to the next. In fact, the war that they're involved in won't be called the Civil War for another 50 years. To them, it's the Great Rebellion. This is before 24-hour news cycle, Twitter, email. The telegraph has been invented, but that's only for important things. Treat me like the ghost of Christmas future. I'm your host. I'll be your guide. As two lovers are separated by war, their only means of communication will be their letters. Some of you may remember those. I'll only interrupt occasionally to fill in the gaps. So, to begin with, let's meet our young man and young woman who will be relating to us the story of Bennington and the Civil War. This is Mary. Her family came to Bennington to take advantage of the many mills, factories, and foundries. Like his father before him, Mary's father went to work at a mill and has risen to supervisor. Her older brother works at the same mill as her father. This is John. His family on his mother's side came to Bennington in its founding, and they have prospered through the generations. Until recently, John worked at a blacksmith shop, but he has since gone to work at one of Bennington's many textile mills in hopes of owning his own blacksmith shop. It was at the Apollo Hall where they first saw each other. It was at a church picnic where they met, it was at a Bennington Battle Day celebration when they realized they were in love. And it was in the parlor of her own family's house where they became engaged. Engagements were much longer than the year is 1859, and Mary sits at her desk at her family home near the Congregational Church, writing a letter to her fiancé, John. John. Even in a small town, letters, letters were still the best way to communicate. They have just returned from North Bennington, where they had been to see the body of our famed abolitionist John Brown go to his final resting place in North Elba, New York, near Lake Placid. Little more than a month earlier, he had staged a rebellion on a U.S. Army in Harpers Ferry, Virginia. His goal was to release, take the guns, and give it to the rebellious slaves. He wasn't successful. He was caught, tried, and hanged. In fact, the noose was still around his neck in the coffin as he went by. Half the states mourned him. Vermont was one. My dearest John, my, my mother wanted to be sure I thanked you for driving the carriage to the depot in North Bennington, so my family could watch the train carrying Mr. Brown's body. It was certainly a sad and solemn affair. We were surprised that so many of the people from town turned out. Since Vermont has never permitted slavery, it is hard to believe that so many states still support that institution. I remember my grandmother talking about the second minister of the church, Reverend Avery, who owned a slave. He was turned out by the congregation as a result. I wish that we could turn out the slave states as easily. 
I guess times have not changed that much in 80 years. Now it seems like a peaceful solution to the situation is almost impossible. I hope that Governor Highland Hall will be successful in his attempts to avert a conflict when he meets with the leaders of the southern states soon. On the brighter side, I was able to get a job at the Valentine Knitting Mill down on Pleasant Street in the Lower Village. I am excited to be making my own money for the first time in my life. Of course, it is only a dollar a week, but it will go a long way to make ends meet. Since you are just a few blocks away at Mr. Bradford's Green Mountain Mills, maybe we can walk home with each other? With all my love, Mary. Dear Mary, indeed it was a very sad day, but brightened by your presence. It is almost Christmas and I look forward to visiting with you and your family over the holidays. Most assuredly I will walk you home after work. I am always eager to be with you. They are having a celebration at the church with all sorts of entertainments and special holiday treats. Will you be free? Finally, John. Highland Hall did meet with representatives from the South, but nothing came of it. Some in the North began to suspect it was a stall tactic to give the South time to arm itself and prepare for war. A little bit more than a year has passed. It is the spring of 1861, and plans are being made for the wedding of Mary and John. But before the wedding can happen, the southern states secede from the Union and fire on Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina. The Confederacy has been born. Thoughts of things like weddings are set aside, as it seems that all the young men in Bennington are rushing to enlist for what they are sure to be a short conflict. April 20th. 1861. Dear Mary, events have happened so rapidly that I scarcely know where to begin. Last night I went to the Apollo Hall on South Street and heard them read President Lincoln's call for 75,000 volunteers. The room was filled to the rafters and many waited outside in the streets to hear the news. Tonight a crowd equal in number met again for the purpose of forming a militia. Some of the men hung a giant flag over the intersection at the Four Corners. And Captain Crossett's coronet band played patriotic songs. Everyone pledged allegiance to the Union. And Highland Hall called the meeting to order. I was just one of four men who had previous military training. So we volunteered to join immediately. The others signed up. But since they have no training, they will have to wait. I don't think they'll get a chance to fight the rebels, though, because we are signed on for 90 days, and the war will no doubt be over before their training is even finished. We all gave three cheers to the Union and the Constitution, then ended with the Star Spangled Banner, which is really hard to say. I am busy packing since we are ordered to immediately muster up in Rutland. Then I will be off for Virginia. I did not want to leave without sending you a brief note. I am sure I will be home in time for the Battle Day celebrations in August, and then we can plan our wedding. I will make $20 a month between a union salary of $13 and the extra $7 the state is chipping in. And that will go a long ways to setting up our own house. One way or another, I will be back on August 15th when we are mustered out. Although I think those varmints will surrender before that. I will miss you terribly and write you every day. Your Johnny. May 1861. My dearest John, I pray that you are safe. By now, you are probably marching through Virginia on your way to Richmond. The president has asked for more troops from Vermont, 
and we are proud that Bennington was the first to respond. We will have the honor of being Company A in the 2nd Vermont Regiment. Captain Walbridge has recruited nearly all of the 100 men that he needs to form a company. It will seem quiet around his old house at the paper mill bridge once he is gone. I worked with several of the ladies of the town to embroider a flag for them. It was presented to the troops in front of the Franklin House with much ceremony. We have spent most of our time at the Gates Hotel near the Village Cemetery on Morgan Street making uniforms for the volunteers. I must say that they will be the best dressed soldiers in the army from the looks of it. Patriotic fever is evident everywhere in town. The students from the Mount Anthony Seminary raised the stars and stripes and several of the boys have volunteered to be drilled by Bill Wilson for two hours every day in order to be ready when their time comes. I am embarrassed to say that one of our schoolboys has volunteered to fight for the South in an Alabama regiment. You would not think that anyone up here would do that, but he must have had family down there. Some of the men in town have carried their patriotism a bit too far. A group of them got together at Dennis Burke's home on Pottery Street in order to raise their own flagpole. The banner reported that the men decided that they would fire a cannon as part of their celebration. It is not clear where they found a cannon, but they certainly did not have the experience needed to use it. Probably due to the alcoholic refreshments they were enjoying, they forgot to move a powder keg that was sitting in front of the cannon, and when the cannon was fired, the keg of gunpowder exploded too. Mr. Myers was burned on the face, and another poor man had all the hair scorched off his head. Thank God that no one was killed. I am certain you do not have to worry about things like that. Please write when you can. Remember that you promise to write every day. I love you so. Mary. Dearest Mary, forgive my silence. It has been much more hectic here than I ever imagined. Aside from drilling continuously, we have been moving from place to place. First, defending Baltimore, then Washington, D.C. itself. We met up with Vermont's 2nd Regiment in time to march to Manassas, Virginia. And there, at a little stream called Bull Run, we met the enemy for the first time. They are fierce fighters and gave us a good licking. No one expected that they would last that long, but their generals, including one called Stonewall, would not budge from their positions. Many of the men from the other states began to turn tail and leave the battlefield, but we Vermonters held our ground and at least enabled a more orderly retreat. Everyone is afraid that this means that the fight will go on longer than expected. I might not make it back home this summer after all. And that means your letters will be more important than ever. Please tell me all the news from back home. How is your ma? How are your sisters? Are you still working at Valentine's Mill? I suppose that a lot of men have left for the war by now. The fields must be in need of work and who is running the machines now? Even though I sometimes complain, I miss the work at Bradford's. When I get back, I will never complain again. All my love, John. Dearest John, yes, everyone is focusing on the war. John Pratt was elected captain and is recruiting men for his company of Zwabs. Have you seen them? They dress like Turks and are quite fierce looking. 
what with their bright baggy pants and Enfield rifles. They left for Brattleboro the other day to catch the train, and four of them had to be turned back because there were too many of them. If spirit counts for anything, the Union will win a victory sooner rather than later. Mr. Pratt's whole business now will be to crush the enemy. There is a cavalry unit being formed here by Captain Collins. They cut an impressive picture as they rode off to the east. Mr. Crossett's military band has formed and is now headed towards the front. We have heard that our old school teacher, George Thatcher, enlisted in the Confederate Army. That is not a big surprise, since he had been teaching down there for the past few years, but it is a shock to know that Bennington lads might be fighting against one another someday. I went to the Shakespeare reading at Apollo Hall last Saturday night. It was moving, but I wish you had been there to sit next to me. Next month, an artist is coming to the hall to show at least, to show his huge panorama of the war. It shows all the battles so far and is worth twice the price, or at least that is what the editor of the banner says. They are rounding up Bennington horses for the army too, so even old Nellie will have to go. How long until you can come home? I miss you more each day. Take care of yourself, love, Mary. Dearest Mary, I do not know how to tell you this, but I have re-enlisted with the Vermont 2nd Regiment. It just seems that unless we all pull together, we will never beat these Rebs. Colonel Walbridge was here and went back home to sign up more boys to fill up the unit. Look him up. He was at Bull Run, and he knows all the details of the battle firsthand. He was the one that encouraged me to sign up again, and I received a handsome bonus for doing it. I think that by the end of the year, or the early part of 1862 at the latest, I will be back for good. We have not had any major battles in a while, just some small skirmishes that didn't amount to anything. But some of the men are sick with dysentery, and few have measles. And they say that more men die of disease than of wounds, but I aim to avoid both. Rations aren't bad, but my shoes are beginning to wear out. I've been walking so much, and the weather has been rainy. If your pa has an old pair that I could use, please send them to me. The socks you knitted have been a real blessing now that the weather is getting colder. Write when you can. Your John. Dear John, I am glad you are safe, and please stay away from any germs you may see. I am continually worried about you. In contrast to your weather, we have been having a nice string of autumn weather. The leaves are as pretty as they ever were, and every now and then, we are able to get out to do something special. This week we saw Dolly Dutton perform. She is one-third the size of Tom Thumb, and she sings like an angel. Mr. Norton, the manager of the Apollo Hall, says that it is getting harder to find performers, but soon he will have the Barkers, the singing family, give a concert or two, I hope they will sing Lorena, my favorite. A hundred months of that Lorena Since last I held my hand in mine And felt the pulse beat that Lorena Though mine be past the bar that
sharpshooters here now. They take a target and put it 200 yards away, and the men have to hit the bullseye on 10 consecutive shots to qualify. Only a couple of men have made it so far. Now here is some surprising news. Captain Shields, who has his summer house out at Furnace Grounds, has been arrested for treason. They waited for him at the post office to come for his mail and put him in chains. He is being taken to Fort Lafayette in New York City and charged with giving information to the enemy. So I guess we have had some excitement here. Otherwise, I cannot wait to see you again. Love, Mary. Dear Mary, it is Christmas here, but the loneliest one I can ever remember. I miss you so much. Some of the Bennington boys were mustered out yesterday, mostly the members of the band. They say that the government has run out of money for frivolous things like that, so they are sending them back home. A few of them are re-enlisting in the regular army, but I would not blame anyone who chooses not to. It's cold and wet nearly every day. I was surprised to hear about Captain Shields. I remember him riding down Main Street in that sleigh of his, pulled by that beautiful horse. It's quite a shock to hear that he was working for the enemy. Please send me a picture of yourself so that I can keep it near my heart. I miss you so, John. As year 1862 dawned, it had become apparent to all that this was not to be a short war. The bloodiest and costliest battle still to come, leaving thousands dead and thousands more wounded. And yet, a simple act of kindness was able to rise above the carnage. Dearest John, the first thing that I must tell you is that Captain Shields has been released. They found no evidence against him, and it looks like it was all just a big mistake. I know how much you respect him, and so I wanted to tell you right away. Not that Bennington does not have its share of traitors. Frederick and Albert Cushman are now in the Confederate Army, and two of Ewell Robinson's sons have joined with North Carolina. You remember the Robinsons. They lived in the house up the hill near the pretty brick one that the banker Samuel Raymond built at Bank Street. Well, Charles Robinson has lived down in North Carolina for several years and is married to one of the local gentry. So that is understandable. But his brother Frederick is just 18 and went down after the war started. You never know about people. We have been busy at the mill making cotton and wool shirts and undershorts. Mr. Valentine is doing all the managing himself since his son, Alonzo, has gone off to war. 
After Alonzo caught gold fever and rushed off to California with the 49ers, I did not think we would ever see him again. But he came back and is now gone again. He has gone in as a lieutenant, but he is so ambitious, I bet he does not stay a lieutenant for long. I know everyone will be glad when he gets home. His father-in-law, Luther Park, is building a new house for Alonzo and Alma right in front of the factory. She is Trenner Park's sister, and so you can bet it will be one of the nicest houses in town. A man named L.H. Thomas has leased rooms over a Selby shoe store at the corner of Main and North for an Ambrotype saloon. I will go down and have a picture taken and send it with this letter if he can have it ready in time. I miss you so much. Please be careful. Mary. P.S. The picture is ready, so I am enclosing it now. Dearest Mary, thank you so much for the ambrotype. I look at it all the time. You are prettier than ever, Mary. We have just come out of Savage Station. That is a good name for the battle we had with Johnny Reb. We fought hard, but the Confederates were stronger. And we were forced into a retreat. We had to leave 2,500 wounded soldiers behind, and I pray they take care of them. During the retreat, we found one southern boy mortally wounded. He knew he was dying. He asked us to get in touch with his mother in South Carolina and tell her that his last thoughts were of her. I have written a letter but Lord only knows if it will ever be delivered. Seeing men die has become a daily occurrence now. I hope that things will be going our way soon. Lieutenant Burton of the 4th Vermont says things have not gone any better with them. And they had to retreat before they ever got near Richmond, leaving 8,000 of our newest Enfield rifles behind in addition to their wounded. All of us Vermont boys wear a sprig of evergreen in our caps so that we can tell one another. Even money is in short supply and we use postage stamps to buy what we need when we can. Please don't worry. It's probably not as bad as I make it out to be. I know that Captain Katie will lead us through everything safely. Pray for us, your John. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred working tasks. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and dark. I can read his righteous sentence in the dim and flaring lamp. His day is marching on. John, it sounds terrible at the front. Madison Winslow has just organized the 10th Vermont Regiment here. It must be bad because now they are paying each new recruit $50 as a bounty to sign up. The banner has been encouraging enlistments. You are needed to thrash out rebellion and restore things as they were and ought to be now, they said in last week's paper. The rumor is that Ransom O'Gore will be recruiting yet another company of men here soon. His farm on the Burgess Road is one of the finest in the area. 
The army promises that it will be for only nine months this time. But we have heard all that before. I hope they are right this time. We go to meeting every Sunday, and now some of the ministers are talking about taking turns visiting the troops. Reverend Mr. Phillips preached a pointed discourse to us about the war this evening in place of Reverend Jennings, who went over to the Methodist Church. Before long, I hope you will see someone from Bennington at your camp. Please try to lift your spirits. It is always darkest before the dawn. All my love, Mary. Dearest Mary, it sounds like the Cushman brothers, Fred and Albert, did not volunteer for the Confederacy as we had thought, but were impressed into service against their wills. They have been heard from by way of a Louisiana regiment who claims that they decided to stay when they had the chance to escape. Now they have been taken prisoner in Maryland, and we will see what happens to them. Another Cushman, Henry, is now quartermaster for the 4th Regiment. And I think that makes him the youngest quartermaster in the entire Union Army. He has quite a head for that since he has run the family business since the death of his father. But he is only 18 after all, and he will make a name for himself someday, I am certain. Our unit was in the Battle of Antietam, Maryland last month and took heavy losses. Thankfully, I escaped injury, and the fighting was amongst the fiercest I had seen. In the end, we beat back Johnny Reb and gave him a thrashing like he's been doing to us. We didn't pursue them when they crossed back into Virginia, and a lot of fellows think we should have finished them off when we had the chance. Now, we are settling into camp for the winter, so maybe in the spring, things will resolve in our favor. It is now in the hands of the politicians. Thank God we have survived this season and hope that it will all end soon. Your John. Dearest John, my heart is broken as you will not be home for Christmas again this year. But I am grateful that you are in better spirits and good health. Many wounded soldiers have been coming home, and a few are being buried in the cemetery next to the church. I know that Henry Loveland was at your side when he was killed in Antietam. Mr. Loring went down there to recover his body, but had no luck. I guess he is buried there with all the other unknown men. They are carving a cenotaph here so that his mother will have a place to mourn him. Calvin Hathaway's body has arrived home and a large number of citizens met his train at the depot and accompanied his remains to its resting place. He was only 17. It was Joe Loring who went to Hagerstown looking for Loughlin's body who discovered Hathaway's body instead and brought it home. Still, they were both older than Norman Puffer. Remember when he signed up in 1861? He was only 14. Of course, he did not tell the recruiter that. But I think that makes him the youngest soldier from Vermont to enter the war. He was your drummer boy in the second, until he was transferred to the Vermont 10th, was he not? That is quite a contrast to old Luke Walton, who has just now signed up at 51 for the cavalry. Bennington is full of brave men. I hope that God protects them all. Gordon Niles was killed in Gallatin, Kentucky a few weeks ago. He went over to the other side, you know, and joined Morgan's band of guerrillas. His remains will not be welcomed back here. I am truly surprised at how many traitors we have had from Bennington. Cap 
Captain Boar's company has gone off to the south after drilling every day in front of their makeshift barracks at the U.S. Pottery. You might see some of them before long. His men presented the captain with a fine sword, sash, and belt to assist him in the fight for Abraham's daughter. Everyone in town loves him and wishes him well. His, his unit is made up of nine-month recruits, so they should be back before next year's harvest, as I hope you will be. Your young friend F.B. Aylesworth is back even though we read that he had died of disease. He is alive, but has lost a leg and the toes on his other foot from amputation. You know how artistic he was, so he is applying himself to arranging beautiful flowers and wreaths made of ornamental hair. That is all the rage now. His work is on display at the drugstore in town, and I'm going to see if Pa will hire him to do something for us. It takes him 20 days to make one good-sized wreath. Peace be with you this holiday, and hurry home as soon as you can. Love. Mary. Dearest Mary, yes, Norman Puffer is a good drummer boy. We can always count on him for a smile and a joke, no matter how bad the situation. I am sorry he transferred out, but I know he'll be in good hands with the tenth. We are wintering in Virginia, and the generals are making plans for the spring campaign. I hope this will put an end to General Lee and his army. We are still marching and drilling every day, but the routine has become monotonous. Many of the men from Washington and Maryland were able to go home for the holidays, but we are stuck defending the Capitol. I long for the day this will all end. In the meantime, I will cut this short and prepare for inspection. With kisses, John. Another Christmas spent apart, another mournful year begins. In Bennington stories of treason and betrayal, new and massive weapons of war, and whortleberries. The deadliest battle in the history of the Republic, and still the cry goes out for more men and more supplies. Dearest John, you sound tired and bored there. I have been helping some of the ladies here organize a festival for the benefit of the sick and wounded soldiers at the big hospital in Brattleboro. The Apollo Hall has been donated for that purpose, and we just finished decorating it in grand style. We hope to collect as much as $100 for the medical supplies that they so sorely need. They are also planning a series of lectures at the local churches for the same cause. Reverend Hubbard is going to speak at the Baptist Church, and then Governor Hall will talk at the Congregational Church. Two years ago, Colonel Hicks gave a speech here on the subject of the great Italian General Garibaldi. Little did we know then that he would be arrested in New York City as a rebel spy. His wife, Sophia Cushman, died a couple of weeks ago here, and I am glad she did not live to see the disgrace he has brought down upon his family's name. The Hicks are a proud family, and this will not sit well with them. They were involved in helping fugitive slaves reach Canada during the Underground Railroad days, although it was very hush hush then. I am joining the Sanitary Commission to make sheets and shirts in the room that the Ladies Soldiers Aid Society has fixed up over the vacant store next to the post office. It is hard work, but good to be in the company of the others. We were all excited by the news in the Troy Whip that Richmond had fallen until our own banner came out with the true story later that day. It was all just a rumor that should never have been printed. 
On Monday last, Paul went down to the depot to watch as the train carrying a monster gun went past on its way to Boston. He said it was for a new gunboat the Navy is building, and it weighed 42,500 pounds and shot 15-inch cannonballs. It certainly is an engine of death and destruction, like the newspaper says. Because of the war effort, the mills around here have been working full time. The only time we are idle is when we cannot get enough cotton or wool for the machines. The Bennington Powder Company has put up a new building for refining saltpeter. Another addition to it is being planned by George Whitney of Hoosick. So more gunpowder than ever will be produced in spite of the recent explosions. Well, that is about it from the home front. We pray every day for your safe return. With all my love, Mary. Mary. Well, at last we are getting ready for the summer offensive. With any luck, we'll have Lee on the run before fall, and I'll be home in time for apple picking. We are moving off to a small town in Pennsylvania called Gettysburg to stop the rebel advance right now. Funny, but we are coming from the southern side, and we'll meet Johnny Reb coming from the north. It looks like every unit in the east will be there, so it should be a big one. I have to run now. Love, as always, your John. Dearest John, we have been reading in the banner about the tremendous victory you've had at Gettysburg. 200 guns were fired in the village on Monday. Bright smiling faces were everywhere to be seen and hope, full of confidence in the final triumph, seemed to pervade every heart. It was cause for much rejoicing, and everyone went in for a share of the celebrating. I hope you are well and not in any additional danger. Please write as soon as you can, and tell us you were in good health. We worry so much. Mr. Seth Hunt, who has that nice big house down by the grove, paid for fireworks to celebrate the victory. They set them off on top of Bald Mountain the one you call White Rocks. I'm surprised they didn't set the whole mountain on fire. It was so bright. The banner is printing a long list of casualties from the battle, and I was gladdened to not find your name listed among them, so that is a good sign. William Ray, Henry Downs, and James Grace were on the wounded list. Our Ladies' Aid Society has forwarded a large, large box to the Brattleboro Hospital. I contributed strawberries and raspberries, and altogether we had six dozen whortleberries, 13 dozen currant wine bottles, a dozen raspberry wine, one dozen brandy, six dozen crab apple jelly, six dozen canned tomatoes, a jar of currants, and a box of mustard. Two other boxes have been sent with food and clothing. We feel it isn't much, but it is all we can do right now. Things are becoming scarce at home. More troops are being called for, I guess to mop up Johnny Reb, but the bonuses being paid for enlistments are enormous. It is now more than $300 to enlist, and if you can afford it, you are allowed to hire a substitute to take your place. Several of the wealthier men in town have done that, including Lyman Abbott. I did not know he was Henry Bradford's brother-in-law, but that shows that he had the means to do it. So someone else will take his place and get the $300 bounty. I do not know if I agree, but it is his choice to make. I remember how happy you were to get $20 when you enlisted. Write soon to tell me you were well. Mary.
Mary dear, I wish I were part of the 14th Regiment under Captain Gore. Their nine month term of service has just expired and they should be home soon. They were around just long enough to play a role at Gettysburg, which I believe has turned the tide at last. Some of them are re-enlisting, but the rest should be marching down Main Street but before you get this letter. I know that Captain Gore has decided to stay on his farm in Bennington for now, and who can blame him? He was hit by shrapnel three times. And it, but at least not one of his hundred-man company were killed that day. During the battle, a man from Wilmington, Vermont, managed to escape from the Confederate line and surrendered to us. He said he'd been in the South when the war broke out and they pressed him into service. He has been waiting for the chance to escape, and this was the first good opportunity. I understand that even their slaves have been forced to work for the rebel cause. Many of the men feel we should have chased Lee on his retreat from Pennsylvania, but Gettysburg took a lot out of us, and we needed a chance to rest. I think we have him beat now. And news from the West is that Vicksburg has fallen to General Grant, so that means the whole Mississippi River is ours again. The end can't be far off. I long to see you. Your John. Dearest John, so much is happening that it is difficult to write it all down. The men from the 14th are home and have reported all the news from Gettysburg. My heart grieves that you could not be among those returning. President Lincoln has called for another 300,000 troops and Bennington's quota is to be 65 more soldiers. The town fathers say that this won't be a problem and that they are raising money to pay a bounty of $200 to each man who signs up. All the local towns banded together to limit it to $200 because in other places it is much more. They say that in Boston you can get $450 and that made Bennington reconsider and raise the sum to $300 each. That should help them reach the quota before the end of the year. Colonel Randall spoke at the town meeting and reported on the war's progress. He said that many people in the North were discouraged because the rebellion had not been put down more quickly. But he assured people the war was going in our favor now. He said that three quarters of our men had re-enlisted after their terms of duty were over just like you. He also said that if enough men signed up, you might be able to come home on leave for 30 days this winter. I pray that is true. It has been so long. A few weeks ago, we all rode over to the North Bennington Depot to see if we could get a glimpse of Mary Todd Lincoln and her son, Tad. They were returning to Washington from spending the summer at the Equinox Hotel in Manchester. Not only did we see Mrs. Lincoln, but also Major General Abner Doubleday, who was traveling with her as a security detail. They say he is the man who invented the game of baseball but I don't believe that. Boys have been hitting balls with sticks for a long time. I am still spending most of my free time preparing boxes for the Army Hospital with the Ladies' Aid Society. That is when I am not working at the mill, of course. We have to shut down occasionally when we run out of wool for the looms and, of course, Cotton is in short supply. Still, we cannot complain. There has just been a big order from the Army for 150,000 yards of Army cloth, and more orders are promised. Henry Burden's Ironworks is turning out horseshoes as fast as he can make them. 
he is justly proud that he made the medal for the ironclad monitor that battled the Confederate Merrimack last year. It is a sign of things to come, I think. I should not tarry any longer. I will sign off with a kiss and hope to see you soon. Mary. As the year 1864 begins, there's still no end in sight. Desertion becomes common, stories of horror and privation, and of all things, politics enters the war. Still, the cry goes out for more men, more men. Dearest Mary, this is the first time I have been able to write to you. I have never been happier to see someone in my life as I was to see you. Although the pain of having to leave you again was hard, it was worth it to see you, if only for a little while. I cannot wait until this fight is over and I can come home for good and we can begin our lives together. This war has lasted so long now that some of the men have been deserting, but that can only end in the disgrace of a firing squad. Remember Ephraim Hadley? He used to cut staves on Mount Anthony for Charles Wilson. He enlisted more than once, then he took the bounties and ran off and changed his name. He was caught in New York, and I don't know what will happen to him. But some of the deserters are being shot in order to set an example. And you can see why they do it now with the bounties for enlisting being so high. Vermont is circulating a handbill that offers $654 for older veterans like me to re-enlist and 554 for new recruits. If you could earn that kind of money a couple times, you would be set for life. Winter camp is pretty dull. We try to keep warm by marching and drilling. There is little chance that the enemy will attack because they are also bogged down by the weather. In the spring, it'll be different. And I think we will make good progress this year. Maybe once I get home, I will ask Olin Scott for a job. His new factory at the head of Pleasant Street has been making all the equipment used in the manufacture of blasting powder. And the business will surely expand with all, that, with all the railroads, tunnels, buildings that this country will need after the destruction. They say that more powder is being used to dig the Hoosick Railroad Tunnel than, than is being used by both sides in this entire war. It is hard to believe, but Scott is in the right place at the right time. And I know he will need iron workers. And with the money I have earned in the Army, and what I could earn working with Mr. Scott, I may be able to open my own blacksmith shop sooner rather than later. Colonel Walbridge has just returned to camp, but his health is not what it used to be. I hope he makes it. But this winter weather is hard on a man. The bully old second sure would miss him. I will close for now, but I will think of you as I fall asleep tonight. John. Dear John, thank God you are safe and settled into camp for a while. There are some new developments here. The federal government has just given a shot in the arm to help the economy in town. We now have not one, but two new national banks. One is run by Henry Root and Luther Graves near the Four Corners and the other by Trenor Park near his house in North Bennington. The government has been running out of gold and silver coins and these banks will help by issuing paper currency, which is guaranteed by local investments in the bank. Mr. Park has put in nearly a half million of his own money, so you know it will be safe to deposit money there. And Root and Graves are not doing anything halfway either. 
Their new BRIC bank is under construction and will be the largest banking institution in the state. It will certainly stand for a hundred years or more. Trenor Park and Seth Hunt have gone in together to build a new free library on Main Street at Silver, where the Wheeler Building used to stand. They plan to allow people to borrow books for no cost, as long as they return them promptly. The building will also have a large assembly hall on the second floor, which is much needed. The old Apollo Hall is becoming too small for many events. The library will be a great addition to the town. It won't be finished until next year, but you'll be home long before that. Your faithful, Mary. Dearest Mary, as you must know, we are back in action at last after a long, cold winter. Colonel Walbridge had to design, resign his commission due to his continuing bad health and spinal difficulties. The doctors thought that he would not recover if he remained in the service. We went through a lot of battles with him. Lieutenant Colonel Newton Stone took over the command. He is from Reedsboro and is as brave a man as you'd ever want to meet. Just a couple of weeks after he took over, we moved into this godforsaken part of Virginia called the Wilderness. While leading us on a charge, Colonel Stone was struck in the leg and he had to be rushed to the first aid station. The doctors quickly bandaged up his wound and within an hour he was back at the front. When the men saw him, a loud cheer went up, but in the next moment he was struck in the head with a bullet and died instantly. The men continued to fight on, but it was a sad day for the second. General Lewis Grant has shared his letter of condolence to the family with us, and he says that Stone was gallant by nature, prompt in his duties, and urbane in his manner. He was beloved by his command, all of which is true, and we will miss him. Young Henry Cushman received a commendation for his bravery here, too. Instead of hanging back at the rear, as he was entitled to do as quartermaster, he volunteered to fight on the front lines. And at one point, he was in charge of a detail of men when they ran into the famous Confederate guerrilla, John Singleton Mosby. They skirmished, but being outnumbered, Cushman managed to get his men away safely. Lucius Billing, who worked for Graves and Root, was also mortally wounded, as were many of the others. There will have to be another call up for replacements after this. So much sad news. I will end this short letter here. John. Do they tell us wreaths of glory? forgotten. President Lincoln has called up more men 
and the selectmen in Bennington have agreed to pay $700 each for volunteers. H.D. Hall and Elijah Dewey were drafted, and they have obtained substitutes. And then Henry Dewey went off to the neighboring towns to try to procure more substitutes. What some of the men here have done is to set up clubs of 10 men each. They pool their money, and then if any one of them is drafted, they all chip in to pay for a substitute. That way, no one is forced into conscription, and we can avoid the terrible riots over the draft like they had in New York City last year. Captain Katie, who you fought with at Bull Run, is back after his three-year enlistment ended. He and J.S. Carpenter have teamed up to open a saloon and billiard parlor on Main Street. And you can imagine just how popular it is with the returning soldiers. I overheard the men talking about George Benjamin, who everyone thought was dead. Well, he turned up alive in Canada, where he has been hiding out for the past year or so. When I think of how brave you are, and then hear that men have just taken the enlistment bounties and run off, I could almost scream. It is a difficult time for President Lincoln. He has had to call up more troops just as the election was getting close, and that gives his opponent, General McClellan, a boost. I know it will be a landslide victory for Lincoln here in Vermont, but I am not certain about the rest of the country. People are becoming tired of the war and would like to just move on, even if it means letting go of the South. People in town have been greatly disturbed by the news of terrible conditions in southern prisons like Libby and Andersonville. Since many of our captured boys have been held there, they say Sergeant Comar died in Andersonville under the cruelest of circumstances. He was sick with kidney disease and passed away from lack of food and water. Lewis Knapp, another one of our local boys, also died there. Major Pratt himself has been captured too, and at first we feared he had been sent to Libby Prison, which is nearly as bad as Andersonville. But now we have heard that he is in a prison near Charleston, South Carolina, and is receiving much better treatment because of his rank. Thank heavens for that. Maybe he will be in one of the next prisoner exchanges. Charles Johnson and Moses Smith have just been returned home in that way. Take care of yourself for me. Love, Mary. P.S. It was just announced that President Lincoln has won re-election. Many enthusiastic speeches were made, and all the buildings around the four corners were illuminated light, late into the night. Beautiful fireworks were set off at Mount Anthony Seminary in celebration of the Republican victory. I do not think the Democrats will ever win another election around here again. Dear Mary, President Lincoln's election certainly is good news. Now that General Ulysses S. Grant is commander, I am certain the war will be over soon. Brigadier General Edward Ripley has been given command of my unit, and I think it is his intention to chase the rebels all the way to Richmond if he has to. He is from Rutland, so it is good to be led by a neighbor. He and General Grant are not about to give up now, and they say the end is near. In fact, we are being called up right now, so I will quickly put this letter in the mail pouch. John. So we made a thoroughfare for freedom and her train. Sixty miles in gladdest to three hundred to the main. Treason fled before us for resistance was in vain. While we were marching through Georgia. Hurrah, hurrah, we bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, the flag that makes you free. So 
we sang the chorus from the planet to the sea while we were marching to Georgia. And then, light at the end of the tunnel and hope for peace. Dearest Mary, at last Richmond has fallen. We fought in a terrible battle in Petersburg and the victory was costly to the men from Vermont. We could not break through the Confederate lines, so the men who had been coal miners from Pennsylvania dug a long tunnel underneath the men, Confederate defenses, and set off an enormous explosion that made a huge hole in the enemy line. Trouble is, the hole was as big as a crater, and once they, we ran into it, we could not climb up the sides, so it was like shooting fish in a barrel for them. Captain George Hicks was one of those killed in the slaughter. And so was Sam Norton. We buried him under a peach tree nearby. And maybe they can retrieve his body later. Henry Downs and Edward Hall were also among the wounded. So I was lucky to come out of it alive. Instead of staying in camp and licking our wounds, we pressed on to take Richmond. We marched into the city behind General Ripley, and he personally took the keys to Libby Prison and freed our men. They are in terrible condition, but safe now at last. Jefferson Davis fled town, and Grant pursued Lee to a little town 90 miles to the west. Having no supplies and no escape route, Lee had to surrender at a farmhouse in Appomattox, Virginia. The end has finally arrived. I cannot wait to get home and settle down. I hope to stay in Bennington for the rest of my life. I have seen enough of this world. Your loving, John. Dear John, all the news has been wonderful. When will they let you come home? We were awakened to the sound of bells ringing in all the churches, and so we knew something big had happened. For three hours, the bells rang out in joy and celebration at Lee's surrender. A cannon was also fired repeatedly all day. Another spectacular illumination at the Four Corners was held, and people cheered and celebrated wildly. People inside Captain Katie's saloon spilled out into the street, and everyone was in good spirits. Mr. Seth Hunt hosted an ox roast over on the lawn of his house, Maple Grove, and after the picnic, he was still able to give every needy family in town 10 pounds of meat. Come home as soon as you can. Mary. Mary, I am coming home. I have been mustered out and I'm just waiting for the train that will bring me back. I should arrive at North Bennington Station in Thursday next. I cannot wait to be with you again. With all my love, your soon-to-be husband, John. And so, our story nears the end. On the appointed day, Mary is at the train station early to await her beloved John. As they embraced, they knew the war was finally over. And soon, they were married. You may kiss the bride. All right, you two, run along. We know you have more important things to attend to. Within a week of surrender, all the cheerful celebrations came to an abrupt halt. As news reached Bennington, the President Lincoln had been assassinated on April 15, 1865. Four days later, in a standing room only packed of mourners, packed the free library hall, which had only been dedicated a month earlier, to hear a memorial service of the slain president. All the speakers lamented of the loss for the nation and prayed that his soul would be at peace in heaven. The proceedings were marked with great solemnity and deep sorrow. All the members of the Protection and Spartan Fire Company attended in full uniform. 
The courthouse, still near Bennington Center, of old first by the old first congregational church, was draped in black. And the flag bequeathed to the town by Governor Isaac Titchener was on display. Reverend Jennings of Old First offered somber remarks. That Sunday, all the churches in the village offered memorial and prayer. Most of the buildings in town were draped in mourning cloth, and a memorial fund was established for the late president's family, and gifts were collected by the post office. Now, to be honest, our playwright took a little liberty and bent their chronology to fit all these events in a short play. Our main characters are fictional, the letters, uh, inventions, but the underlying facts of Bennington in the Civil War are true, even if no one person could be at all those battles. For the record, The body of Bennington Colonel Newton Stone was returned for the battlefield cemetery after the war. His body laid in state in the courthouse, and his coffin was draped with the grand old flags that the ladies had made for the Bennington boys only four years earlier. Major Alonzo Valentine came back to Bennington and took over the Valentine Mills on Pleasant and Valentine Street after his father died in 1866. He became a community leader and helped establish the graded school system and was responsible for the Vermont Soldiers' Home being set up in Seth House Hunt's house. He lived to be 74. Captain Ransom Gore lived to the ripe old age of 86, east of town on his farm on the road that is now known as Gore Road. Quartermaster Henry Cushman came back and established a, a series of prominent businesses in North Bennington, including the renowned Cushman Furniture Mill. He also teamed up with Olin Scott to plan the Bennington Battle Monument. Scott's Bennington Machine Works became one of the largest employers in town, and he amassed a fortune through the development of his heavy-duty equipment. It was said that at one time, all the gunpowder produced in the United States was made with his machinery. His philanthropic work was wide ranging, and to this day, the Olin Scott Foundation gives more than a million dollars in scholarships per year from his offices at the People's Bank Building. Lyman Abbott, the man who had hired a substitute when he was drafted in 1863, continued to work for Bradford Mills and took over when Henry Bradford died in 1873. He became a member of state legislator and was very active in the community for the next 40 years. Jewel Robinson's boys, who fought for the North Carolina troops until 1865 when they were both taken prisoner during the Battle of Bentonville. After General Lee's defeat, a month later they were released and spent the rest of their lives in North Carolina in the grocery business. They never came back to Bennington body of Henry Loveland that couldn't be located after Antietam was eventually discovered and brought home to be buried in the village cemetery. General Edward Ripley retired from the army, lived in Rutland for the rest of his life, and after his death, his Civil War memorabilia came to the Bennington Museum, including his uniform and the key to the notorious Libby prison. And Norman Puffer. Well, <laughs> he might not have been the youngest soldier from Vermont after all, but when he returned, he worked for Alonzo Valentine in the knitting mills, and he became one of the town's leading businessmen. He was the, became the director of the Bennington County National Bank and was one of the owners of the Bennington Wax Paper Company. Until he died in 1912, he continued to tell the stories of all the experiences in the Civil War and how he had been in Ford's Theater the night that Lincoln was shot. In 1930, a monument to Bennington Civil War's veterans was unveiled in front of the Bennington Museum. It features the name of 337 soldiers 
marching off to war. Border surrounding the likeness of General Standard, General Ripley, Colonel Veazey, and Colonel Walbridge. We thank them all and their families for their sacrifices. It's a debt we can never repay.